The world is as divided as it's ever been. We all see it or feel it. The hopelessness, confusion, frustration, the weariness. But it's times like these that matter most. Times like these where we have to decide exactly who we are, who we're going to be, what we're going to do. Where we have to decide, will we shut our doors, fence off our fields, look after our own? Or will we swing wide those doors, make the whole of the earth our field, celebrate what makes us different, hold fast to what makes us one, to plant the seeds of peace, love, of hope, to reach deep with both our hands and scatter those seeds like he told us to. Will we be the people God made us to be? The peacemakers, the lovers of the lost, the light of the world? Will we open our hands, our doors, our lives, our eyes, and work to bring this world what it's longing for? Well, it's an honor to be here. And anytime I'm invited to open God's word and to preach, uh, if I'm not preaching at the church I pastor, uh, I try to say yes, because I love to, to speak and to share God's word. Uh, you don't get the full uh, joy of my wife and I being here this morning because I'm only speaking, she's not speaking with me. Uh, but tonight we're going to be speaking, I guess from 5 to 7 o'clock at another church in the area, I think you have the details, but we're going to be speaking together for a, an area-wide Nazarene rally. So hopefully you're be able to be a part of that and you'll get the, I don't call my wife my better half, I call her my better three quarters. And so uh, we'll be teaching together tonight. Uh, I, something struck me as we were worshiping, and before I get to my message, I just want to share a word with your congregation that I really feel like the Holy Spirit put on my heart. Uh, as I was just worshiping with you and, and engaging and coming to God's presence with this congregation, it struck me that you can, you can tell when the Holy Spirit of God is present, when you're among God's people. And I felt that so profoundly this morning as we were worshiping together. I don't know if you know it. Sometimes when you have a good thing, it's kind of like a kid who grows up in a home with parents who love them. They kind of take it for granted. Uh, your worship team, there's 95% of the churches on the planet would beg to have a worship team like you have in this church. I mean that. Your, your worship team is amazing. And so I want you to know that. Yeah. Um, and I want to thank, thank all of them for just, for just leading us into the presence of Jesus. That is such a, such a privilege and such a joy. And I was thinking about, I had a chance to preach in a church called Green Lane Church in, in Auckland, in, on the other side of the planet, in Auckland, New Zealand. And as I was preaching there, exactly the same experience. The presence of the living God is here. Not just in Oklahoma, but in New Zealand. I had a chance to preach at a church called the Moody Church, which is in Chicago, where Dwight L. Moody preached. I just, I don't know, it was eight or nine months ago. And being there in that environment, just so struck with the presence of Jesus and then the Holy Spirit's presence. And I'm, as I'm standing over here singing with you and looking at your worship team and kind of taking a peek and looking at the congregation over here, mostly looking at, because it was easy to look kind of at this group right here, um, just, just the sense that this is the body of Christ and the Spirit of God is present. And I hope you feel that. And I hope you realize that and understand that um, this is just a great church and it's an honor to be here. So th thank you for the privilege of letting me open God's Word. I want to I share a message that, has, that, that just consumes my heart. I want to invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Luke chapter 8 and just turn to Luke chapter 8, put your Bible right in your lap in front of you. If you, have your, if you follow on a phone or on an iPad or something, go to Luke chapter 8 and have it open and ready. And I'm going to get to that in just a minute. We're going to dig into that. But I want to kind of give you a setting because there's certain moments... And you probably had this, where you, you've read a passage in the Bible, and you've read it one time, or 50 times, or 100 times, and, and you know what it says, and it's touched your heart, but there's certain times where all of a sudden something happens, and you, and you have this, oh, I, 
I get it. I see that passage in a new way. Or all of a sudden the Holy Spirit sort of shows you something deeper in the scriptures than you saw before. And I had that moment in a very unique time. Uh, I, I grew up in a town. I was born in a town called Newport Beach and raised in Huntington Beach, California. Southern California, coastal Southern California. And where I grew up, it was pavement. It was just pavement from the ocean all the way to the San Bernardino Mountains. And there were no towns in this. There was towns, but you didn't have the sense of a distinct town because there were, everything was a, sort of this Los Angeles, Orange County, urban sprawl with cement and town to town to town to town. So you didn't have like town parades and civic pride. You just lived in the, the kind of the Los Angeles, Orange County basin. But it wasn't like the sense of small towns. And then God called me and my wife and our three little boys to Byron Center, Michigan, a small town. When I say a small town, I mean they were very proud of the fact that they had a street light. Uh, they had one street light on the corner of 84th and Byron Center Avenue. It was the only light in town. And that, and that was where all the action was. That's where the, you know, that's kind of where everything happens. That was near the high school and that was kind of the activity hub of this small town. And I grew up in urban sprawl and now God called me to this small town. And, and so one day, my three boys, uh, Zach, Josh, and Nate, there's little guys, they come running up to me as a group. They say, Dad, 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 can we go to the Byron Center Parade? We want to go to the Byron Center Parade. And they're all excited. And the first thought in my mind, I didn't say this out loud, I'm a parent, so I'm sensitive and all that. But in my mind, I'm thinking, of course not. Who wants to go to the Byron Center Parade? I mean, it's going to be this teeny small town parade. No one's going to be there. I mean, it's a teeny town to start with. I, I, I went to school in Pasadena, California, where the Rose Parade happens, right? <laughs> I'd been to the Rose Parade, and I got tired of that. You know, another float, another marching band, that's great. But I was just like, I'd been to the Rose Parade, and that didn't really keep my attention. So I don't want to go to the Byron Center Parade. But here's my three boys. When these three, when they, the, imagine these little faces of these boys. But, but they come run up to me, and they're saying, Dad, can we go to the Byron? And they're so excited. So if your kids or grandkids come and say, can we do this with their cute little faces, what do you say? Of course you do. So I find myself sitting on the curb near the corner of 84th Street, by Byron Center High School on Byron Center Avenue in Byron Center, the small town. And I'm expecting there's not going to be any. I said to my boys, well, who goes to this thing? And you know what they said? Anybody from, been, been to small town parades? Who goes to the small town parade? What's the answer? Everybody. <laughs> so I get there and I look down the road on both sides of the road. It's like four or five people deep. And it's just the sprawl of people. I'm thinking they must have bussed people in from like Wayland and Door and the other small towns around there. Because there's just more people than, and at the parade than there are in all of Byron 7. So I'm sitting on the curb looking at this and I'm thinking, what are all these people doing here? Why, why are they here? And the kids are all sitting like on the front, in front of all the adults, like on the, on the edge of the road. And they've got like bags and, and um, uh, like uh, pillowcases and stuff. And they're all excited. They're all wound up. And they're all just really energized about this parade. And I'm thinking in my mind, it's just going to be like flatbeds with the girls' junior high volleyball team on it. And like the local fire truck and like some... And, and, and I was right. That's pretty much what it was. I'm thinking, why are, I can't figure out why are these kids, why are they all here? And why are these kids so excited? Now, if you've been to small town parades, you might know the answer to this. In one word, can you tell me why these kids are excited? Candy. There it is. See, I did not know this. And the, anytime I'm in an area that, where there's people that have grown up in small towns, it's all the same. Anywhere in the world, it's candy. And so what I found out was at small town parades, in every float, on every flatbed, in every convertible, there are children with buckets of candy. And they have one job. You know what that is? What's the job? Throw it out at people, right? So I, I'm a student of, of people. I'm always studying people, watching people, looking at people, and trying to figure out things. And so I'm sitting there watching this drama unfold. And here's what I figured out. There's, there's really two kinds of kids in a small town parade when it comes to throwing candy. And you can see the, the first one there. There's what I would call the conservative, cautious, careful, candy-throwing kid. So there were some kids, as they're sitting in, their, in the convertible or on the flatbed or in the truck, they're going down the parade route like this. And so you've got to imagine they're sitting there, and they, they turn out of the Byron Center High School parking lot, and they're moving down the road. And the kids on the, on the side are just going, throw us candy! We want it! Their arms are up, and their bags are open, and they're waiting. And there's some kids on these floats that are doing this. They're, they're rolling down the parade route. <laughs> 
And they're, and they're, they're like going down the parade run. And finally, they're, they're, they've gone like halfway down the parade. They find the right person. And like the wind conditions are right. And, it's, and they finally look and they make eye contact and they're ready. And they finally, and they might, they'll throw like very carefully one little pack of candy, right? And I'm, so I'm watching these kids. And this is what I'm thinking. They must be thinking when the parade is over, what? They get to keep the candy in their bucket. They must be thinking, when it's over, I'm going to keep all this or something because they don't want to throw any candy. But in every float, on every flatbed, in every truck, in every convertible, there were also kids that I call a reckless, radical, relentless candy thrower. And these kids, they, they turn out of the parking lot of Byron Center High School, and the first person they see, they're just throwing, oh, aren't you? You're going, I should have sat in the front row of church today. If Pastor Kevin comes again, I'm sitting in the front. And they just, and they're just, look now, look now, don't get, oh, and they're just throwing candy like they, yeah, 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 oh, come on, bring it to the front row, praise Jesus, we have a witness here, there you go, and they're just throwing candy like, like, and, and I'm watching these kids, and I'm thinking to myself, these kids must think, and when the service is over, you may come and get a piece of candy out of the bucket if you'd like to, all right, um, these kids must be thinking that there's no end to the candy they can throw. But I'm thinking, they're going to get like 100 yards down the, the parade route, and they're going to be out of candy because they're just two-fisted, candy-throwing machines. And, and this is one of those moments where I'm sitting there on, on Byron Center Avenue, and I'm watching this unfold, and the scripture comes to my mind, Luke chapter 8. The passage I'm going to read right now comes to mind. So as I read this passage, I want you to think about that story. I want you to think about that moment. And I want you to follow along in your Bibles or on your, on your phones and see if you can get why this passage came to my mind. Why all of a sudden it started coming alive again in a fresh way. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable, he told this story. A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was, what's the word? Scattering. As he was scattering, there's a sense of generosity. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on. The birds ate it up. Some seed fell on rocky ground. When it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Some seed fell among the thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up. And it yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When Jesus had said this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Do you see it? Do you get the picture in your mind? Do you hear what Jesus is saying? Do you get the, 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 the moment of this, this story, what Jesus is trying to get at? I'm going to pray that we get this. And not only that we get it in, 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 our, in our minds and understand it, not only that we get it in our hearts, but that we would get it in our lives. Lord Jesus, I pray right now for Broken Arrow Nazarene Church that you will move in power in this body of people, Lord, that this, this group of worshipers so filled with your spirit, so in love with you, Lord. I, I, just being here, I can see the glory of Jesus in this place and on the faces of your people here. They reflect your presence. I pray that they would become radical, reckless, relentless, generous scatterers of the seed of the good news of the gospel of Jesus. Will you let your light and your truth shine from this place all over this community and to the ends of the earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I live near the Salinas Valley. Uh, some, uh, if, if you have a salad anywhere in the world, there's a good chance something in your salad bowl came from the Salinas Valley. It's one of the largest, richest, uh, fertile uh, uh, areas in the United States, and it just, it's called, it's, some people call it the salad bowl of the world. And so it, it's just this massive valley that goes on and on and on, and there's so much produce comes out of there. And so I have a lot, have a lot of agricultural people, a lot of farmers in my church. And I was asking some of them, I said, you know, I said, this, this story of this guy throwing seed and scattering seed like on roads and in weeds and in you know, all these different places. I said, I, know, you know, I said, in the ancient world, seed was very expensive. I said, what's it like now farming? I mean, how important is seed? And then people said, oh, you got no idea. 
Seed is like the amount of we spend on seed. We calculate everything. So he said, they, I had one guy say to me, we know when to plant the seed, how deep to plant the seed, how far apart to plant the seeds, how to prepare the soil. I mean, they, it's, it's a science. They, they'll get three or four crops in some of the areas there in the course of a year, not just one crop, but over and over. So they say, it, 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 seed is expensive. Well, in the ancient world, the people that are hearing the story are in the first century people, right? They knew that a farmer would be so careful with their seed. Because farmers didn't have government subsidies. Farmers didn't have insurance policies. If they didn't get a harvest, they didn't eat. If they didn't get a f- harvest, their family would probably not make it another year. I mean, it, was the, it was a big deal. So the, the farmers would, would plant carefully. They'd prepare the soil exactly. They would scatter seed in what they perceived to be good soil, hoping for a good harvest. No farmer in Jesus' day would throw seeds on the road. No farmer would throw seeds in the weeds. No farmer would throw just, just, this farmer is a strange farmer. This farmer is just going and throwing seed all over the place. And what Jesus is getting at is not about farming and seeds. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the good news of Jesus. And you, if you're a Christian, you are the farmer. And the world is the field. And we often call this the parable of the sower, and we always focus on the, the, the soil, the different kinds of soil. But I want to focus on the sower. I want to focus on the farmer because that's what we're supposed to be. This farmer was reckless. This farmer was bold. This farmer was a seed-throwing machine and would just throw seed everywhere he went. And so I want to ask you three questions. And the first two I want you to actually answer out loud. And the third question I want you to ponder and think about for a moment. So... If, if we're the farmers, if the world is the field, and, and if the seed is the gospel of Jesus, here's my first question. Where should we throw the seed of God's love, grace, and the message of Jesus? Where's the right place for us to scatter the seed? What's the answer? Everywhere. Everywhere. Everywhere, Everywhere we go. Well, this, this uh, person looks a little hard-hearted. Scatter some seed. Well, this person seems like they're weedy soil and they're caught in the things they're wrong. You know what? Scatter some seed. Everywhere you go, scatter, 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 scatter. Here's the second question. When should we throw the seed of God's love, grace, and the message of Jesus? What's the answer? When? All All the time. Every moment of every day. But you know what a lot of us do? We have the good news, something way better than the Snickers bar, let me tell you. We, we have heaven. We have Jesus. We have the glory of God. We have the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, fellowship with Jesus, the body of Christ. We have everything wrapped up in the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And some of us will travel through life like this. And we're waiting for the perfect moment and the exact person, for the, the soil to seem exactly right. And we think that we're doing the right thing because you don't want to throw pearls before swine. You don't want to waste the gospel. But this passage is very clear that this sower, that this farmer, just scattered everywhere all the time. And some of the seed didn't take root, but some of it did. And when it did, it had a harvest a hundredfold. So here's my third question. And I want you to really think about this for a minute. I want you to ponder this. Why should we throw the seed of God's love and grace and good news even when the soil might not look receptive? Why would we scatter the seed of the gospel freely among people and to a person and to a family who looked hard-hearted and resistant, who didn't look like they were good soil? Why? Now, before I give you the answer... I want to I tell you a quote I heard. This is a quote I heard years ago about pastors. I love this quote. Here's the quote. What, what, what is a pastor supposed to do? You might have heard this before. Maybe you've never heard it. What's a pastor supposed to do? And here's what I was told. To comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> Say that again. What should a pastor do? Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Isn't that good? So somebody say, afflict us, pastor. Somebody say it. That was really pathetic. Can you tell that was, that was half-hearted? Someone say, afflict us, pastor. Okay, let me challenge you, okay? Why should we scatter seed even when we look at the person they don't look receptive, when we look at the soil that doesn't look like good soil? And here's the answer. Because we're not smart enough to know when the soil is ready. We're just not smart enough. You say, well, you're a visiting pastor. You're going to come and tell me I'm not smart? That's not what I'm saying. You're probably brilliant. 
But you're not smart enough, listen closely, to look at another human being and to know if their heart is ready. You're not, that's not your place. That's not my place to decide if this person is ready for the gospel. Our call is to scatter. Our call is to scatter the love and the grace and the presence of Jesus everywhere we go. That's our call. We're not smart enough to know. And I praise God. I personally praise God for people who, who did not think they needed to wait to scatter seed in my life till I looked ready. I was almost 16 years old, 15, almost 16 years old. I was a, I was a self-centered, self-indulgent, sinful surf punk who spent more time... My, my, I was getting an 0.75 in school. My great point average my sophomore year was an 0.75. I would only go to school if I wanted to. My parents didn't really know what to do with me. I had hair down to here and an attitude that was terrible. And my sister Gretchen became a follower of Jesus. I grew up in a home with no faith. In an extended family of over 100 people, only one Christian that I knew of. And my sister Gretchen became a follower of Jesus. And my sister Gretchen, one year older than me, just started to scatter the love of Jesus in my life. She was painfully shy. She still is to this day. My sister Gretchen is painfully shy. But she put in words her love for Jesus. And I was merciless with her. I'm embarrassed when I look back and see. I took my sister Gretchen's Bible, threw it on the ground and stomped on it. So I want nothing to do with this. And she just kept scattering. She just loved me when I hated her. She told me her, she'd play her Christian music and she'd talk about her love for Jesus as best she could in her own shy way. And God used those seeds that she scattered. What, I, I, I must have looked like the hardest packed soil, the weediest soil, but she just scattered. And then another person came along, a guy named Doug Drainville. Doug was a really old guy. He was in college. He, he was like 19. And, uh, and this guy, Doug, who was a friend of my sister Gretchen's who went to her church... He, he met me, and he just start, Doug just started to scatter the seed of Jesus in my life. He actually said to me, he, said, he knew I didn't have a li- driver's license. He said, he said hey, Kevin, if you ever need a ride anywhere, let me know. I'll drive you. Well, it's like Uber before Uber. It's like Lyft before Lyft. It's free rides, right? So I would call this guy, and this is true. I would call this guy. He would drive from Westminster about 20 minutes away. He would drive down to Huntington Beach. He would pick me up. He would drive me to my girlfriend's house. And then when I would call later, then he'd go home. He'd drive back. He'd, he'd spend like almost an hour shuttling me around. I don't think, I look back, I don't think I ever offered him a penny for gas. And I don't know if some of the times I even said thank you. I was that self-absorbed. I was that much of a punk. But he would just serve me. And when we were driving together in his little brown Volkswagen Beetle, he would talk about what mattered most in his life, which was his family and his girlfriend, Lisa, who he later married, and his love for Jesus. And he would just talk about Jesus like Jesus was his closest friend in the world. And you would think that all that seed was just bouncing off a hard heart, but it wasn't. Even though to the outside I looked like a hard-hearted person, my heart was ready. And then my sister Gretchen and this guy Doug invited me to come to their church, to their youth group. And I I turned my sister down over and over and over. I just rejected every invitation she gave me. Finally, she said to me, Kevin, I'm going to invite you to a youth thing at my church, but just listen before you say no. And I said, okay, fine, what is it? She said this. She said, it's a casino night. So there's going to be roulette wheels, 21 tables, a 20-girl can-can dancing line. This is a lot of years ago. Um, (laughs) And you're going to get $100 of play money, and you can gamble all night. And for the first time, church sounded interesting to my 16-year-old sinful little heart, right? I mean, I'm not recommending you put on a casino night here in the worship center, okay? I'm just saying that this, church, this youth group did this thing to, to reach hard-hearted kids, and I showed up. And that night, the youth pastor gave a message. I still remember it. This is, this is now more than three, de- three decades ago. This is four decades ago. And the youth pastor gave a message, life's a gamble, where are you putting your chips? And he said, to, he said put a bet on Jesus. I didn't receive Jesus that night, but that youth pastor, Dan, started to pour into my life. And as Gretchen scattered seed the best she could, and as Doug scattered seed the best he could, and as this guy, Dan, scattered seed, to every outward appearance, I would have looked like the most hard-hearted person you could meet. 
But somehow, by the grace of God, my heart was tender. And that seed took root. And I came to know Jesus. I became a follower of Jesus Christ. The summer before my junior year of high, of high school, my whole life changed. The day I became a Christian, I, I prayed my, one of my first, I prayed my, I think my first prayer ever was to be, become a Christian. And my prayer, and you want to know how unchurched I was, this was, my, this was my conversion prayer. God, I don't know if you're real. And Jesus, I don't know if you're really there. But Jesus, if you are really there and if you really died on the cross and if you really paid for all my sins and if, and if you want my life, you can have me. I gave myself to Jesus. And he moved in. And that night he called me to be a pastor. That night. I was actually, we were, I was with a, on this youth outing and all the guys were put, the, the girl, it was, we were in a houseboat on the Sacramento Delta. The girls were all locked inside the houseboat because guys and girls, you know, girls were all locked inside the houseboat. The guys had to sleep on the roof. I thought later, what if it rained? But we were locked out of the houseboat the whole night on the roof, uh, this flat roof with our sleeping bags. And I remember laying there on this roof of this houseboat, looking up to the heavens and said, okay, God, what now? I had given my heart to Jesus. What now? And God spoke to me as clearly as, a, not out with my ears. I couldn't hear it, but in my heart, clearly as if, as if I could hear it with my ears. This is what God said. Spend the rest of your life telling people about Jesus or you'll be miserable. That sounds a little bit harsh, right? <laughs> but I'm a 16, almost 16-year-old 16 kid. I didn't know much, but I knew this. I didn't want to be miserable. So he said, okay, then I'm going to become a pastor. I made a commitment within the next morning. I'm climbing down the, the ladder of the houseboat and I see the youth leader on the houseboat. And I, and, and I said, I said, hey, what do I have to do to become a pastor? And he looked at me. He says, dude, you've been a Christian for like seven hours. I said, yeah, but I'm supposed to become a pastor. And he goes, he goes, get a haircut. <laughs> that was the first thing he said. I said, seriously? And he goes, no, you don't have to get a haircut. But he, he, but he said, he did this. This guy, he got me a Bible. He said, this is the word of God. You're supposed to read this. And he gave it to me. It took me about three months to finish it. Went back to him and I said, okay, I'm done. What do I read next? He said, how far did you get? I said, I'm done. I read it. And it was a study Bible. I said, I read the whole thing and I read all those little notes at the bottom too. I said, what do I read next? You know what he told me? He said, read it again. <laughs> I've been doing the same thing for 40 years. Just read it again and again and again. Um, can, can I tell you something? If you go through your life looking at each person you encounter trying to figure out if they're ready for Jesus, you won't scatter much seed. But if you're like the sower, and you just scatter all the time, everywhere, everywhere you go, all the time, freely, generously, joyfully. Because here's the deal, it's not your job to save anybody. You can't. You didn't die on the cross, did you? No. You didn't rise again, did you? No. It's not Jesus saves. That's his, that's his work. What's our job? Scatter. All the time, everywhere we go. And if you get rid of all the worrying about if it's the perfect time, and if you just will love people and serve people and care for them and show Jesus. And, and some of you listen to this and you say, oh, Pastor, you don't understand. Uh, that's not my gift. I'm shy. I'm quiet. I don't talk about my faith. It's personal, but I, I, it's kind of private. I keep it within in myself. And some of you say, you know, that, that, that's uncomfortable for me to share my faith. Let me read a passage from the Bible to you. In Luke 9, 23 to 24, Jesus said this. Then Jesus said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. This is the invitation of Jesus. I mean, think about this. This is the invitation of Jesus. Deny yourself. Does that sound easy to anybody? Deny yourself. Does that sound easy? No. Take up your cross. In the ancient world, the, probably in the history of the world, the most brutal, inhumane form of execution conceived by the human mind. It was torture. It was public. It was humiliating. It was intended that the, the people who drove the nails were trained to make sure that they didn't do too much damage in terms of the blood flow because the person who was supposed to stay on that cross and suffer for as long as possible. And Jesus says, just take up your cross every day and be ready to die. And then Jesus says, follow me wherever I lead you, wherever I call you to go. You have a mission field. You know where it is? Wherever God sends you tomorrow. Wherever God sends you this afternoon. That's your mission field. That's where God calls you to go. This is the invitation of Jesus it's a called a reckless faith that costs everything. 
And this is the heart of God's missionary people. We are on mission. We are called by God to scatter seed everywhere, all the time. And we don't try to figure out, is this the right moment? We just scatter seed. So, two things. One, tonight, at the seminar that Sherry and I do, we're going to be giving lots of ways to learn to scatter seed. But I want to give you a few right now to kind of get you thinking about this. A few ways that you can live out this call to scatter seed. So what's God's call in the life of every Christian, including his people at Broken Arrow Nazarene Church? What's God's call? How do you scatter seed? How do you live out this missionary calling? Whether you're, and only about 3% of Christians are, are, have the calling of an evangelist. Only about 3%. The other 97% are just called to scatter seed in the flow of their normal life. Some are evangelists, but most are just Christians. But Christians are called to scatter seed, all of us. So, number one, love people as Jesus does. Just love people as Jesus does. In, in, in Matthew 9, we see Jesus looking at people and he sees them, he's, he sees them as he has compassion. Why? Because they're like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus loved the people around him. Broken people, sinful people. People that you'd say, oh, I'm not sure if I want them in our church. Jesus loved them right where they were at. People caught in prostitution. People who were embezzling from their own people and, and extortion of their own people. He loved them. And that's our call. That's how my sister Gretchen, and that's how this guy Doug Drainville began to scatter seed in my life. They just loved me. As nasty as I was, as selfish as I was, there wasn't a single time that Doug told me no to drive me around unless I couldn't get a hold of him because he was doing something else. Back in those days, there were no cell phones. So if he didn't, it wasn't home when I called, I couldn't reach him. But if he was home and answered the phone, he's like, yeah, I'll be right there. And he just served and loved and cared. Listen closely. You can do that. You can love people with the love of Jesus. Start to pour out his love to those who seem farthest from Jesus, who seem toughest in their hearts. Second, pray for and with people when God opens the door. Pray. Man, there is power in prayer. My wife, my wife just wrote a book called Praying with Eyes Wide Open. It has changed my life as a prayer. I used to think I was a terrible prayer because I couldn't sit for like a half an hour and sit still and focus and just pray with my head bowed and my hands folded quietly. I can't sit still for five minutes, much less a half an hour. You don't even know me very well yet, but this is me preaching slowly. This is me settling down, all right? And, and, and I'm, just, I'm just wound up. I don't even, I don't even do, co- I don't do any caffeine. I don't drink coffee. I've never had a cup of coffee in my life. I'm just wound up. And so, so for me, the idea of sitting like quietly in a chair and praying forever, I can't do it. So I thought, I'm not a very good prayer. And then what my wife has taught me is that the Bible teaches that prayer is something you do all day long. You don't have to close your eyes when you pray. Matter of fact, she has a whole part in her book that talks about how there's nowhere in the Bible where it ever says to close your eyes when you pray. And there's not even a single example of anybody closing their eyes in the whole Bible. I didn't know that. We had a friend who was a scholar at Oxford who said, I think you're wrong. And then Sherry basically said, I think I'm right. He went and studied, came back and said, you're right, I'm wrong. And so it's okay to close your eyes when you pray, but also you can just pray as you... So now what I do, what I, do I just pray all day long. And I can pray anywhere I am. And I, and I feel like, man, now I've become actually a... i become a person of prayer because I'm praying all day long. I'm not good at sitting for half an hour, but I probably pray 20, 30, 40 times a day, out loud, quietly, when I'm driving. Never close my eyes when I'm driving when I pray. Um, right? And, and so... Pray for the people that you love that don't know Jesus. Pray passionately, pray consistently, pray relentlessly for them. And then pray with people. Listen to this. Pray with people who aren't Christians. Pray with non-Christians. You say, well, I can't pray with a non-Christian. Sure you can. Well, they they would say no. I have prayed, I'm going to say probably now with thousands of non-Christians through my life. And I've never had a single person tell me no when I've asked them if I could pray. Not once ever. I was on a plane flying to Ireland, and sitting next to me was a woman who was an atheistic communist, an atheistic communistic humanist who ran a camp in former East Germany to keep people, young people from becoming Christians. Before the flight was over, she let me pray with her. She didn't pray to receive Jesus, but she let me pray with her that her heart would be open to know who Jesus was. And I've t- taught this to so many people, and, and, and people who start doing it. Now, all people say occasionally, I, I ask somebody, and they say, oh, no, thanks, that's not my thing. It's like, whoa, I suffered for Jesus. Um, somebody said, no, thank you. Is that suffering for Jesus? No, it's not. And so, and so here's what I want to challenge you to do. Whenever you're with somebody 
who has gone through an incredible loss and pain, who's not a Christian, would you look at them and say, you know, this might seem weird, but I really believe in prayer. Would, would you let me have the honor of just taking a moment and praying for you as you're going through this? You know what most people are going to say? Yeah, I really like that. And if you're talking with somebody who has incredible joy, maybe you have a friend who's, who's not a Christian and he just became a grandpa for the first time. He, said, he shows you, hey, look, at this is, my, this is my granddaughter. I'm a grandpa for the first time. I'm so proud. I'm a grandpa. And you say, you know, listen, you know I'm a churchgoer and I go to, the, you know, go to Broken Arrow Nazarene Church. And um, would, you, would you allow me just to take a moment right now and say a prayer for your grandchild and pray for you to be a wonderful grandpa? Now, he might say, no thanks, but you know what he's probably going to say? Oh, yeah, that'd be nice. And when you pray, God shows up. God shows up. I was actually in the air, in airport at the, at the customer service counter. As we were sharing, we were having a connection problem in an airport. And I'm at this customer service counter. And I'm talking to this woman here. And this guy right over here um, is on the phone. He's obviously distressed. And he's really worried. He's, on, he's not on the regular phone. He's on his cell phone. And you can tell he's really... And I'm kind of focusing on this. But I'm picking up all the stress over here. So finally, after I finished talking with her, I just turned to this guy. And I, I said, are you okay? And he said, um, he says, oh, I got family and friends in Puerto Rico. And this is when, uh, this is when Hurricane, Juan, Hurricane Juan, which was just a couple weeks ago, you know, was descending on Puerto Rico and just, dev- he, said, he said, and he just, with stress on his face, he says, I can't get a hold of my family. I can't get a hold of my friends. I'm so worried. So I'm standing at the, at the United Airlines counter with customer service people. And what do you do when somebody says, I'm just losing my mind because my family and my friends are in harm's way and I, don't, I haven't heard from them. And so I actually said to him, I actually said, I said, my wife just wrote a book called Praying With Eyes. And I gave him a little background. I said, I said, can I just pray right now for your family and for your friends and for you? I said, just keep your eyes open and act like you're just talking to me like a customer so you don't get in any trouble. He goes, okay. He goes, okay, okay. And I said, I'm just going to keep my eyes open. I'm just going to just say a prayer for your family and your friends. He goes, okay. And so this woman, too, she says, she's basically looked at me and she says, okay. So she's going to join in now with us in prayer. And so it was really neat. As I started praying for this guy, I kept my eyes open, too. And this guy... He just like locked on my eyes like this the whole time I prayed. And he was just like drinking it in. I don't know if he's a Christian or not. But I know that he was in a desperate moment. And when I said, can I pray for you? And afterwards, both of them were like, thank you so much. He goes, he goes that was just so beautiful. And I said, well, listen, I'm going to keep praying for your, for your family and your friends. He could have said no. And if he would have, that would have been okay. But God shows up when we pray. And so let's, let's be praying. And... Pastor, there's no countdown clock here. And I usually have a countdown clock that tells me when I'm supposed to be done. Tell me how I'm doing and if I should say amen or do I have another four or five minutes? Are you sure? Okay. I got an hour? No, okay. Uh, Okay. Two more thoughts. Number three. Engage freely and often in spiritual conversations. Talk about your faith. I couldn't do that. I couldn't talk about my faith. Yes, you can. You know Jesus. You've met Jesus. He's in your heart. He's in your life. He's your greatest joy. God's doing stuff. When you go through hard times, He's present. You know, your non-Christian friends, when they go through hard times, they're alone. They don't have the presence of the Holy Spirit. They don't have the comfort of the book of Psalms and the Scriptures. They don't have a church gathered around them. They go through it alone. And when you share with people just your journey of how God comforts and cares for you in the hard times, that speaks to their hearts. I was training a woman uh, who was on an outreach influence team, which I know you're working on developing here at your church. It's kind of the key leaders of, of the different ministries gathering and talking about how to help the church really scatter the seed and go out and reach out. And I was talking with a woman who was on this outreach influence team in a church in the Chicago area. And I was leading the team at that point, and so I was doing some training with her. And she was praying over and over again for this woman who, um, who uh, cut her hair. And it's just, a, so she'd go in about, I don't know how often, reg- regularly get her hair cut. And she'd been talking to this woman about Jesus and every time she says, every time I bring up Jesus, this woman just kind of shuts me down. I, I'd offer to give her a Bible a couple of times. She says, no, I don't want a Bible. So she says, I'm trying to have spiritual conversations, but she's kind of been closed off to me. And I said, well, just keep praying and keep looking for opportunities. And this woman, her name's Karen. She, was, she told me this after it happened. She said, yeah, I was getting ready to go and get my hair cut. And she said, I got news that my daughter, Nikki, uh, had a relapse with cancer. Her daughter had been battling cancer for years. She said, I just got, like, I got word the day before I was going to go get my hair cut that Nikki was going to have to go through a whole other series of treatments and stuff. And I was just heartbroken. And so I thought, I don't want to get my hair cut because I want this woman who cuts my hair to see me as a joyous Christian. And I'm just so sad right now. But she said, but she said if I didn't show up, I had to pay for the haircut anyways. And so she said, I've already paid for it, so I'm going to go, but I'm just going to act like I'm fine. I'm just going to act like I'm great and I'm going to be this happy Christian, right? And so she said, I got there and I sat down and this woman said to me, how's Nikki doing? 
And she said, I just sat there in the chair and just began to weep. And she says, I basically wept for the next hour while she cut my hair and did my hair. She said, I just, she said, I kind of wept and I blubbered through my tears. And I, and I just told her, oh, it's, it's so hard. We got this bad report and she's going back through chemo again. But she says, but I didn't realize as I was talking, I just started, I said, you know, but, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sad, but I'm hopeful because... I know that God is with my daughter and I know that he loves my daughter. And, and, and she said, and I just, and I shared, and you know, I've been reading the Psalms and I shared with her a couple of Psalms that were giving me comfort. She said, and my church, Faith Reformed Church, she said, my church loves me. And she said, she said, what I didn't realize is for the next hour, I talked about my faith. But I talked about my pain and my sorrow and how my church loved me and how the scriptures got, gave me comfort and how God gave me hope. And she said, at the end, of, she said, I was, she, and here's the thing, she said, I was talking about my faith the whole hour, she said, and I didn't even try to. So I was just telling her about my life and my hope and my strength comes in my Christian faith and my Christian community and the word of God. She said, when she finished cutting my hair, she said, I didn't even realize I was giving witness to my faith. I was just talking about my life. She said, but when she finished cutting my hair, this is what her, the woman said who cut her hair. She said, you know, Karen, you've offered me a Bible a couple of times. And I told you, no. Is that offer still open? Can you get me a Bible? Why did she, what changed? Karen shared her faith. Not just out of her joy, but out of her pain and the comfort of God. Talk about your faith. Have conversations about faith. And we'll look at that more tonight at this event we got that we're going to be doing. And, and then last, what is God's call in the life of every Christian, including his people at Broken Arrow uh, Nazarene Church? To tell your story and his story of faith and transformation. Tell your story about how Jesus changed your life. Whether you became a Christian like my wife did at five years old, she has a story about how she heard the gospel from her parents and her Sunday school teachers, and she tells the story of Jesus about how she heard it as a five-year-old. I tell my story about how I became a Christian as a 15, almost 16-year-old. And you may say, well, I became a Christian at 30 or 40. Well, tell your story about how God has changed your life and how he continues to change your life. I love the story in, in the gospel of John chapter 4, the woman at the well, where the woman meets Jesus at the well, they have a spiritual conversation, she, she puts her faith in him. She, she says, well, when the Messiah comes, and he says, I who's speaking to you, I am he. I'm the Messiah. She believes. And once she believes in Jesus, you know what she does? She takes a three-year training course on how to share her faith. No. You know what she does? Do you remember the story in John 4? She runs back into town and tells everyone she knows, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. And trust me, everything she ever did was not really good. She was a broken, sinful woman who had been transformed by Jesus. And she had been a Christian for about five minutes. And she started saying to people, come and meet Jesus. You can invite people to your church. I tell you something, this is a good church. God is present here. His spirit is present here. Invite people to come and meet Jesus. Tell your story of Jesus. I could go on and on and on. I won't, but I could go on and on. But I just want to close by giving an invitation. Just to think for a minute about when you get to the end of the parade route. You have one life to live for Jesus. One life. And if you have been given the gospel, if you come to faith in Jesus, the beauty of the gospel is this. The more you give away, the more you throw, the more you have. You have enough candy over here. Did I get you on the first time by? The more you throw, the more you have. The more generous you are, the more you have. Some of those kids in that parade, they might have run out of candy in the first five minutes of the parade, but you never run out of the gospel of Jesus. I think the more you scatter, the more you get filled with the gospel and the more you want to scatter. So when you come to the end of the race, when you come to the end of the parade, when you come to the end of your life, well, you have gone through your whole life as a Christian like this. Waiting, waiting. Waiting, waiting for the perfect moment, the perfect person, the perfect time. Or will you go through the, your life just scattering and scattering and scattering and then scatter more 